Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with Hernando County Extension, and joining me today is my regular co-host, Lily Browning, our Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator. And we're hoping that we're going to have another guest joining us in a little bit. She's probably been kind of delayed. They were supposed to get um, very important people from the university visiting their office today. And, you know, things pop up and emails roll in. My oh. phone seems like never, ever stops dinging. <laughs> and questions come in the front door. And we're, this is definitely not a relaxing time of year for us. No, right now. oh, good Lord. Yeah. And I was just telling you about my adventures in Rain Barrel. Um, <laughs> yeah. Ordering. <laughs> So I think we've got it straightened out. <laughs> so That's good. So you're going to continue having rain barrel classes this coming year? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've got plenty in the storage even right now, um, but I'm getting a bunch more in and there was some hiccups with that. Um, since, since we're bringing up rain barrels, um, but we have, we have one coming up on this, on the 20th is that this coming monday i guess it is no it's not this coming monday it's the following monday yeah, monday on the At 20th but that is for no. Fernando county school board employees only and it we really only have one or two spaces left um that um um that came about, you know, just because, you know, they say they want to come and, you know, not able or whatever. So this, this is for school board employees. Anyway, you don't have to be a teacher, but a school board employee. So we're doing it while they are the first day that they're off before they get too relaxed. Um, <laughs> and that'll be at the, at the Hernando County landfill. So that's going to be interesting and um, have Carmen working on getting chairs and stuff. So hopefully it'll be an outside event and on that top is of the hill? no not on we're not going to be at the very top of the mound <laughs> we're not going to have it on trash mountain no we'll have it okay um, i have some fluorescent bulbs at home i need to bring and drop off too okay while I'm there. that'll be great then okay. there will be two more um rain barrel workshops and compost um workshops in january one january 22nd which is a Saturday, and that's going to be a lot of fun because it's going to be at the Hit Thicket <laughs> Hammock Preserve here in Hernando County. It's going to be a combination outdoor rain barrel workshop, outdoor compost bin workshop, and a walk through the preserve with environmentally sensitive lands um, coordinator Mike Singer. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And then I was just talking to Bill before we went live. Um, the following Tuesday, we will be venturing into an in-person. So it's going to be pretty limited, limited to 20 humans. So however many barrels <laughs> that's going to um, come to at his office on uh, Tuesday, the 25th at 10 in the morning. The reason I went ahead and stuck another one in there is trying to be as um, helpful as I can because as um, February 1st, we're going to continue. We will continue to have rain barrel workshops, compost bin workshops. The compost bins are free for Hernando County residents, one per household. The rain barrels um, as of February 1st, and uh, like anything else, supply chains. <laughs> what, what am I getting at, Dr. Lester? <laughs> Your rain barrels are on a very, very slow ship from China that's sitting in San Francisco Bay somewhere, I guess, waiting to be unloaded. Actually, they're pretty readily, more readily available than I thought they would be. But what am I, why am I trying to fit more classes in January so that what's going to happen on in February with the new load that I will have in? Oh, your prices are going up. Boom. They'll go up. They'll go from $50 um, to... 64. Um, but if you are a customer of Hernando County Utilities, right now, 
through January, if it's your first barrel, you'll pay $50 and you'll get a $25 credit on your water bill. As of February, you will pay $64, but you'll get a $30 credit on your water bill. So we're trying to help you out a little. But for those of us not customers, you know, it's going up. That was the lowest bid, you know, $64 a yeah. piece. So still, I'll have to do a recheck at some, um, I've done checking at, you know, some of the big box stores, the exact same rain barrels that I'm able to buy in bulk and then provide for $50, 25 really, if you're a customer. You can get at uh, the big box stores for 150 something. Wow. <laughs> so I imagine they're going up as well, you know, for the big box. Yeah, stores. I still need to get one too. I don't have one yet, so. And you're a customer, so you'll get the rebate. So I guess I have to take the class, and I think I'm going to have a lot of questions at the end. A lot of difficult questions for you. Okay, looks like Neil has a lot of difficult questions, so let's Yes, start we actually have some questions them. coming in here. So, Neil asks, do we have any seeds at our Hernando County Extension office like before COVID-19? That's an easy one. No, we don't. Mm -hmm. On rare occasion, we'll get seeds donated to us, and nobody has donated to them to us for a couple of years at this point. We've gotten them from Rural King, two different Rural Kings, I think, and one or two other places. But yeah, we haven't gotten any seeds for a while. So we don't have any at the moment. Sorry. Yeah. And Thena asks can you give information on tropical soda tropical soda apple plants or also known as tsas tsas yes and thena if you want another rain barrel january is the time to get it <laughs> <laughs> yes and tropical soda apple has nothing to do with rain barrels directly but um tropical soda apple is a really nasty invasive plant it's in the tomato family, so loosely related to uh, tomatoes. What makes them really nasty is they have very, very large, sharp spikes on them. Think a plant where the stems are covered with long needles and the underside of the leaf has needles sticking out of it. You don't want to be pulling these up by hand. It's Rarely a problem really for homeowners because you can pull them up and get rid of them pretty easily. People who have livestock, it's a very problematic because what happens is the plant will grow and it flowers and it makes what looks like kind of a funny striped green cherry tomato. It looks and like cattle. a little tiny watermelon. That's what it looks like to me. Yeah, yeah. A little tiny green watermelon. It has like the same pattern on it. Mm -hmm. And then cattle and probably horses also love it and they, they gobble do. it up candy to them it's yes it is like candy even though it's very sharp they tough it out because they taste so good and then cows tend to walk around and poop a lot so they spread the seeds and now you can go if you have a pasture and cattle you go from a couple plants to a huge number of plants eight minutes Eight minutes What's into that? the program. Eight minutes into the program before you mentioned poop. I was just Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do go on. <laughs> we I think we need to start. We'll we'll track that for my annual paperwork. How's the that? Poop -meter. I'll, I'll there somewhere. <laughs> the average length of time before poo is mentioned on the virtual plant clinic is <laughs> 8.23 minutes just to see if somebody's <laughs> actually reading my paperwork yeah <laughs> but people with um livestock their animals you know eat the the little fruits the little what looks like a green watermelon looking cherry tomato and poop it out and spread it all over fields it could be a problem if you ever get manure that was contaminated with the seeds or sometimes even hay that was grown in a field that has a lot of tropical soda apple. So if you look online, University of Florida has a ton of information on it, a list of all the different herbicides that are going to be effective on it. 
and safe for either your farm animals or your lawn or whatever is the plant that you want to keep. And there was also a beneficial insect they released a number of years ago that feeds on tropical soda apples and helps to keep them under control. It doesn't make them go extinct or go away, but it does help keep them under control. And that's the tropical soda apple bug, I think. I think that's the name of it. <laughs> if you want more information, though, next week, uh, we will probably have a special guest on here with us. Uh, Dr. Emily Krause is with Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Sciences, and she is in charge of the lab where they raise air potato beetles. They raise the air potato bulbill beetles, which is a new beetle they have, and we're going to be releasing here in Hernando County soon. She releases the parasitoid wasps for the Asian citrus psyllid still, I think, and she can tell you a lot more about biological control because she works directly with it every day. But probably the most important tip I can give you with uh, TSA plants, make sure you wear thick gloves, very thick gloves. Another Scary place gloves. I've seen them growing years ago, um, remember the housing crash of like 08? And we were looking for a house then in the Royal Highlands. And there was so many houses that had been built or half built and then abandoned so that the lot was cleared and maybe sod was put down, maybe not, but it had been abandoned literally for a while. And I would see a lot of tropical soda apple coming up in those abandoned yards. Where it came from to get there, how it came out of a pasture, I'm not sure, unless there was, you know, so it was somehow transferred, but that's where I would see some of it as well. So if you're in a house that maybe went through that situation and you actually have it in your lawn, that could be why from, you know, 15 years ago, it's still trying to come up. Yeah, and contaminated fill dirt is a very good way to spread invasive plants. I, we, well, you and I saw air potato plants move through fill dirt. The houses they were building right on Wikiwachi. Mm hmm yeah, oh yes. And so any seeds or plant parts or little fruits or anything that's in that fill dirt, wherever it comes from, it's a fantastic way to move nasty invasive plants around. So. We've been to so many different houses. That's why one of us looks confused when the other one says, remember we went to that place? And Which until place? That data, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, until we you know, put the uh, thumb drive in each other's heads to see the same picture. <laughs> oh, yeah. That <laughs> Neil so asks, Neil asks, don't know. would a church <laughs> as a customer of Hernando County Utilities be able to get that rain barrel through the program? Email me. Let me find out. I'm not sure and if you know. it would be you know, considered a commercial entity. Um, I know there are, we have plenty of churches who are customers of theirs, but they're probably considered commercial. It's never come up before. So email me and let me find out. I'm certainly willing to. Um, to work with you know with you on that you have enough people actually in your church who are interested in taking some home we could even set up a workshop at your church too at community center for other people just give me a call yeah. i don't think i'll squeeze it in before january <laughs> yeah 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 we're the, the year is running out we're getting kind of short yeah. here and Neil is also considering growing fennel, and do they grow well in containers? Yes, fennel can grow very well in a container, and fennel grows during the winter. So if you want to grow it this year, you probably want to get it planted very, very soon. So fennel is one of those cool season herbs that normally you plant in the fall, let's say October-ish, and it's going to grow all winter and be pretty much finishing up by March or so because not long after March, it gets hot. Seems like in two or three days, summer is here. And fennel is a host plant for the uh, one of the swallowtail butterflies. And you will get a ton of great, big, beautiful caterpillars on your fennel that are gonna turn into great, big, beautiful black swallowtail butterflies. So after that point, no more fennel for you. 
you need to just give it to the caterpillars and raise caterpillars. But you can grow it and eat fennel all winter long if you plant it early. Okay. And a follow up on the tropical soda apple. Uh, Athena says thanks. Ooh. 19 acres of it, yeah. Yeah. She said they pulled hundreds of plants on my daughter's 19 acres. Yeah, 19 acres can hold potentially a lot of invasive plants. <laughs> so, obviously, if she has uh, cattle or got any kind of infected manure or anything like that, that's probably how it got there. Um, a lot of times with invasive plants, it just takes diligence. You can go, and like I said, University of Florida has a lot of control information, control plans. If you want to incorporate cutting it back, spraying it with an herbicide, things like that, it tells you what to do in the spring, the summer, the fall, everything step by step. But she for 19 acres, in, um, I guess it's, in, it's going to take some probing grass to, um, you know, I'll compete it. <laughs> Yeah, That's you don't like something you, you would say, isn't it? <laughs> yes. See, I played the bill part that time. <laughs> it sounds like something you would say. Don't do that. You know, <laughs> I was kidding. You could probably order Kogan grass seeds on eBay, though. <laughs> they probably have it. We don't rec <laughs> be recommend it, though. And yes, Neil, yeah, you could try planting fennel seeds right now. I'm not sure off the top of my head how long it takes to grow and mature, but it's worth a try. And like I said, maybe in the past, in the future, try doing it earlier in the winter. I'm laughing at Heather. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Playing devil's advocate. <laughs> oh, Heather, I'm sure that you can go on eBay and find Kogan grass seeds and air potato bowl bills and all kinds of stuff like that. Yes. Do not plant an invasive plant to fight an invasive plant. That's not the way to do it. And it looks like Neil is going to become another regular viewer of ours. So Great. bit by bit, one by one, mm -hmm. we're going to get there. So speaking of, um, I was just talking to you before we started too, yesterday. Sorry, I'm trying to keep my voice. <laughs> Yesterday, um, I saw on one of the neighborhood Facebook groups, <clears throat> which is one of the things we say, those are fantastic for finding out Christmas activities in the neighborhood, a good school, a good doctor, getting neighbors' opinions. It's not necessarily the place to go for horticultural or yard advice. So someone yes. had a picture you know, what is this? What do I do about it? And it was, you know, like a row of sandy mounds. And they did correctly identify it as a pocket gopher. Um, because, you know, a gopher tortoise isn't going to have the whole row of them. They're going to make their home and that'll be that. So then all the advice that followed. You know, anything you can think of from noisemakers um i'd have to find it again it would seem like everything people were advising just i'm thinking it just not going to work but some of them seem to feel they did work and it could have just been when you know what is the rule that correlate correlation is not necessarily causation yeah yeah that's that sounds good yeah so they think, well, words. we tried this and the, and the pocket gophers went away. Could be that it was just time for them to go away. And like we or were saying, we, we hate to get those questions about moles and pocket gophers and things because there's no easy answer. We don't have, you know, most of those products, all of those products out there are not going to work. Um, and then, then you venture into illegal activities that you don't want to do. Oh, somebody mentioned mothballs. Oh, mothballs. yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to do that. So here comes Wendy. Yes, we have a special guest. Wendy, you need to turn on your camera. <laughs> Are you there, Wendy? 
You need to turn on your microphone also. I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. And I'm working on the camera, so. Okay. Hey, there we go. It works. How is everyone? Great. How are you doing? I am fantastic. Glad to be here. Thanks for the We are interview. being joined today by a very special guest. Wendy Lynch is also with University of Florida Extension, and she is a family and consumer sciences agent. She is our district family and consumer sciences agent. So she's pretty far up there. She's pretty important. Uh, <laughs> 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 words, Bill. We so very often when we don't, when we're not talking about poo, which comes up a lot. Um, it already has today, yeah. Yes. Um, you know, when we talk about edible crops, we venture into how to prepare it. So it's great to have someone who can um, officially talk about that as well. Happy to. So Wendy, what do you, what does a family and consumer sciences agent do? Let me go ahead and put you on the spot because sure. you're the first one that we've had on here. We've had corn so agents and livestock and a little bit of everything else, but no FCS. Well, I am glad to be here. So Family and Consumer Sciences, it stems, if you guys remember, the old home economics. So that's where our, our, it originated from. But we're not just stitches and stirring anymore. We've um, moved into more of a health extension approach for the, at least the health and wellness side. So we cover chronic disease prevention, health, nutrition, health and well-being as a whole, um, housing, finance. So everything you need to live life successfully falls into family and consumer sciences. So you cover pay raises also, right? Um, we don't have an impact on those. <laughs> However, if you need to learn how to manage what you've got, we can do that. Oh, okay. Good answer. And that's like what that. you have right there in your office. Um, Bill Scott Taylor is the family and consumer science agent, and he his whole focus is on finances. Yes, financial yeah. counselor, accredited financial counselor. He's fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He helps, I know, a lot with um, SHIP, mm -hmm. first time mm -hmm. home builders, and you know, people just trying to figure out what to do with budget and how to get their credit, you know, established. So, but um, they, the program as a whole can go beyond that as well into food prep and even. Um, are you still is the program still involved with getting your serve safe certification for restaurant workers it is it is for for some um for some counties they do have that program available so we definitely in all counties we're, we're covering food safety but the, for the actual certification it depends on the on the county mm -hmm. we used to here <laughs> but, yeah, but that I person used to have a certification yeah. i took uh, food safety classes in school at uf mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and took the test and got certified it's lapsed but yeah but wendy works a lot with health and nutrition so i know the topic of different recipes has come up in the past we start we get off on a weird little path and start you know trading recipes and we talked about horseradish one day oh, and yeah. somebody up in the panhandle wrote a really really good blog post about how to make your own horseradish from the raw root Mm -hmm. and how to grow it here in Florida. It'll grow here. I'm still making me hungry for horseradish. <laughs> <laughs> the Northwest um, horse District, radish. they have a really great program um, the, called the Healthy Table, and they do, um, it's all virtual, and they do a cooking, almost like cooking demonstrations, how to incorporate a lot of Florida products. So I wonder if that's part of that group. Could that could be that developed the sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Yeah, I know Fresh from Florida does a lot of work and they incorporate things that you can grow here in Florida and then ways that you can cook them mm -hmm. kind of more creative, tasty ways. Because unfortunately I encountered over Thanksgiving a couple of younger relatives and apparently the thing is now that there are people who eat who won't eat anything at Thanksgiving other than macaroni and cheese. Like, <laughs> I don't like and I'm sure that they'll eat pepperoni pizza too and fast food, but they have a very, very limited um palate, I guess. 
the produce for better health has really great recipes as well as the fresh from florida they have um i believe chef justin and i can't remember the other chef's name at this moment but um, they have a lot of food prep videos and how to incorporate a lot of those vegetables and different florida products into your recipes and they're very like super professional uh video sound effects so it gets you really excited about prepping some of the foods so definitely check those out um heather has a very good question about farm fresh eggs i'm sure that comes up all over everywhere look at this wendy you even got a question on here already <laughs> sure so you would have to check with your county specific um guidelines i don't know who is in hernando specific that would be able to answer that because that's not in scott's wheels wheelhouse i don't believe but he may have an idea um i would have to check i'll check out right now and see if i can find the answer to that while we're yeah. while we're live and if not feel free to um private chat your email and we can get that back to you that answer back to you if i don't get it in just a few i know who, yeah who covers there's... that area is that the state that regulates that or the individual counties so it's sometimes both okay it's gonna be, yeah it can be both um just because a federal law it's just saying things with food safety like if a federal law um is issued it's up to some of the states to incorporate it. like the food code for example um it's up to specific states to accept it or not I think it's also has something to do with how it's advertised. You know, obviously the eggs aren't graded and haven't been pasteurized and all that. And I, maybe that just has to be known, but I don't know the exact, I know plenty of people who do sell them, but I don't know, um, you know, how that all works. Seems like at one time or another, I did know the answer to that, but it's, it's left me and probably that was probably 20 years ago and may have changed anyway. Was that back when you lived in Mazark Town that you had more experience with chickens? It's back when I worked for Hernando County Extension for Donna Peacock, who was the family <laughs> consumer science agent. <laughs> in Mazark Town, they send them right to the packaging uh, companies to be graded, and you know, they did when it was the chicken capital of the world. Yes, here in Hernando County, we used to have the chicken capital of the world. But now we have um, homeowners and residents, and you are allowed to keep chickens in Hernando County. There are very specific rules you have to abide by. Obviously, if you live way out in the country and you're zoned agricultural, the rules are different than if you're in more of a suburban, like Spring Hill environment. In Spring Hill, in the suburban environment, it was passed that you can have four chickens no roosters yeah um, in your backyard so and all of your neighbors have to approve of it all the ones who right. border your property lines contact a hernando county code enforcement because they are the ones who enforce those rules and they can give you a printed copy of everything you need to know before you don't want to get chickens first and ask for forgiveness <laughs> later that's not a good plan so i put a few um in the private chat because i'm not really i'm new to Streamyard, so i'm not really sure how to make it post but i did put in the private chat especially the second link from fdax regarding limited poultry and egg operation requirements and then you would also want to check with your your local entity also i can post that and you could post that also in the chat like the open chat and it'll show up I see it only theoretically in, in the different places that we're broadcasting to. Okay. Yeah, I don't see an option for me on that one. So you have to school me well, on that probably one. A not, bit later. She's oh. not a host or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah no, you put it there. <laughs> that'll be good. And we do have a food system in seasons uh webinar video live event experience coming up and we will be discussing backyard chickens in one of our episodes so be sure to be on the lookout for that yes we will we're going to have our own specific show on youtube live yep. and it's going to be fridays and i will definitely when we have more details and uh, links and everything i'll definitely be sure to share that and i don't know if you checked your email in the last hour or so <laughs> but we got approved. We so, did. Yes. This is awesome. 
finally. <laughs> yep. So we're good to go. So that's going to be a really cool um, program. It's almost like a, think of it as a, uh, not episodes. What's it? Oh, seasons. Mm -hmm. So like you would see on, on a show, the favorite TV, hopefully it'll become your favorite food system series. <laughs> we're going to do one in spring or winter. And then also in spring, just five sessions each time. So it should be a lot of fun. We have our experts from across the district. And like Wendy said, we'll be talking about touching on chickens, beekeeping, vegetable gardening, raising fruits, a lot of different components of food systems. Um, Nutrition, <laughs> mindfulness, mm -hmm. um, the importance of health and well-being, that cross-section between food systems and well-being, and just trying to... Um, kind of give you a big broad picture of food systems and, and how it impacts everything. Very important information. So you can start the new year off right. More Thanks for your excitement, Paula. Calm and relaxed. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Calm and relaxed. That's what Eating we're shooting right. for. January is a good time to do that. Yes. Oh. Okay. And Buddy is suggesting he wants some vanilla growing updates. I did that a month or two or three ago. I started doing monthly um, food system Zoom classes on different things that people could grow. And one of them was vanilla orchids because Dr. Alan Chambers down in South Florida is doing research on vanilla orchids trying to breed different varieties and grow them in Florida, which varieties do grow in Florida, which ones don't. And he was kind enough to teach the class and it went really, really well. There are a lot of people interested in growing unconventional, unusual things, a little bit more than just radishes and lettuce and broccoli, things like vanilla orchids. Uh, buddy, I'm planning on in, over the next few months having a class on dragon fruit which you may be a little too far north. Buddy's a regular viewer up in the Panhandle. So we have people from all over the state tuning in. That's awesome. That's where I grew up in the Panhandle. So near and dear. He's, oh. he's from Tallahassee. Okay. Well, well, I did. I will say as a UF employee, <laughs> faculty member, I did go to Florida State also. So Yeah, Bill has one of those That's in okay. his office. Too. Um, the, uh, the marine agent, the Sea Grant agent, she went to <laughs> FSU as well. Yep, that's right. <laughs> so we're, we're split. So I'm at UF and, you know, my graduate at, uh, at UF and then undergrad <laughs> at Florida State. <laughs> Buddy's okay with that. Like I said, Buddy's awesome. one of our regular uh, viewers from up in the panhandle. He I'm not really sure class. who else is on today. He watched my class yesterday. Um, he was a participant in um, the shady side of your landscape, too. Mm -hmm. See, he thinks we don't see him, but we see them. <laughs> and we have a lot of people from South Florida or, or from south of here, Pinellas County yes. and Brevard County, Broward County. Yes. Got a lot of tropical fruit questions in the past. So that's great. And, you know, if it's something that I can't answer because you live in a different part of the state, we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of locals, too, like Heather. Mm -hmm. And Heather got three different varieties of dragon fruit. There are different varieties. If you look really closely when you're at any grocery store, they're starting to carry it more and more. And as a matter of fact, I just bought a pack of three yellow dragon fruit which i'd never seen before it's kind of yellow on the skin and still white on the inside i got them as sam's and they were good they're, they're nice and big um i've eaten one and a half already i think i like dragon fruit a lot i don't know if i've ever even tried it i was going to make a little promo video on it and also cut one open and show what it looks like on the inside so I guess I'll have to have Wendy approve that video since it, you know, it deals with with food okay. safety and nutrition and everything. Well, if you Dragon do, fruits are tasty. They're not really sugary sweet. And I have been told that it's, if you have uh, sugar and diabetes issues, it's safer to eat than a really, really sugary fruit. But of course, you always want to check with the doctor. 
so it's kind of um low sugar low sweetness fruit looks like kiwi fruit you know when you open a kiwi fruit it has those little tiny microscopic dot seeds dragon fruit has the same thing i've read that you can actually plant the seeds and they'll germinate i've never tried that's that's an awfully small seed to be messing with i think but well that's a, um before you saying that they propagate them through tissue culture yes because my class as a part of it you will take home at least one dragon fruit plant and they will come from tissue culture from uh a grower that we work with now called AgriStarts over in Apopka, really nice people. And they have tissue culture starter plants. And I believe they're also low carb. So Paul is asking, are they low carb? And, oh, Wendy, do you know if they're low carb? So I'm looking at um, the Food Data Central from USDA and this is a historical record for dragon fruit. And for, I'm going to do one ounce. It is about 23 carbs. So it's not low. Mm -hmm. um, but it does, one thing it does have that you may not expect is 30 milligrams of calcium. Oh. Low, low in, obviously has no cholesterol, no fats. Um, nothing on the vitamin A side, but vitamin C, it does have a, a, a 1.79 milligrams, which is a little low percent, um, small amount of fiber, and about 73, 74 calories. So well, in general, I mean, they, they're, that's how they're made, you know, to be reproductive structures, they're going to be high in sugar, almost any kind of fruit. So all foods fit though, you know, everything in balance. Right, right, right. Exactly. It's a good way to add variety. Carb, right. It would be hard to do. And Lee, who lives down in Broward County, says dragon fruit with blueberry smoothies is really good. That does sound good. It does sound good. Well, there's a, um, a smoothie shop near my office here, and I read that and was thinking, hmm, smoothie for lunch. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> See, we, we get on these things and we get hungry. <laughs> well, I, it doesn't look delicious, but it really is good. Um, packed with kale. Um, a little pineapple, chia, almond milk. Yeah. What else I put in there? But I, I do that with the only thing is missing shop. is dragon fruit. <laughs> <It's really laughs> shop, no matter what I get, I usually have them put like the kale and spinach um, combo. And then sometimes I'll have a shot of dark chocolate, you know, and then with yeah. the fruit and stuff. Yeah. And then the color looks, um, you know, kind of like baby poo. But <laughs> but it is good and really healthy. So. Wrap a really cute napkin around it and drink it. You just don't. Yeah, drink it you <laughs> so, if anybody has any other lawn and garden questions or food nutrition, if you're looking for any uh, uh, good recipe suggestions, go ahead and. Put that in the chat and ask away. And yeah, balance is the key, especially with the holidays. We're in the middle of them. There's food, food, food everywhere. Yeah, too many cookies and stuff like that too. <laughs> and they're all they're all really good. But. And we're supposed to enjoy the holidays. You know, it's not about it's not necessarily the time to to try to lose weight, but just try to maintain over the holidays and go into the new year strong. <laughs> just don't pack on too much over the holidays that's what i'm kind of aiming for you know what you do I you, that that'll be good you just partner it so whenever you have a really sweet food or a good meal then go for a family walk or take yourself out and take the dog for a walk you know just partner it with something that's going to help to balance it there we go and I tell you what, I don't know what it's been like down in South Florida or up in the Panhandle, but here in Central Florida, it's been beautiful so far this winter. Um, We've November taken was full colder than going yeah. out and about and going to fairs and festivals. And I'm sure it's going to get cold in January and February. So you need to keep that in mind with your plants. Don't be putting dragon fruit in the ground right now. It's probably going to freeze. 
But go out there and take advantage of the beautiful weather while it's out. Uh-oh, Paula has a question about moles. Uh-oh. <laughs> As I said, we hate to answer questions about moles or pocket gophers because we don't have any easy answers. Without yeah, Lily, Lily and I discussed this before the show this morning. It's the, it, it is that time of year. Uh, moles and gophers are fairly seasonal. We only get questions from now until March or April or so. Well, Paula asks, any solutions for mole control without pesticides? My yard is a mole metropolitan. <laughs> Moles and gophers are both small furry animals, and they are food for a lot of other animals. So hawks and birds of prey will eat them. Snakes eat them. Predators eat them. Coyotes, if you live in an area that has a lot of coyotes, coyotes eat anything. Moles and gophers included, if they can catch one. So you never have a mole that's going to be in your yard digging it up for years at a time. They tend to be fairly short term. They're there for a couple weeks, maybe months, but they're not there forever. If what you have is an actual mole, and moles will make the little pile of sand and then the little raised sand mound to the next pile race sand. they make lines around your yard basically there's not a whole lot even pesticides don't work we really don't encourage the use of poisons putting them out there for that because birds get a hold of it your neighbor's kids get a hold of it dogs cats everything get a hold of it a lot of off-target organisms can get a hold of those poisons and it potentially causes a lot of damage if you keep doing the old chewing gum, dog fur, blowing compressed air into the hole and really, really aggravate the moles, they tend to leave your yard and move into your neighbor's yard. Sometimes that's the best you can hope for. But there are really no good controls and um, a lot of the different poisons are strictly controlled by FDAX. And for some of those things, you have to get an actual permit to be removing or controlling moles or gophers gophers the, and there are the southern southeast pocket gopher i think may be protected so you have to get a permit to control them moles i believe are not protected i don't know if the southeastern pocket gopher is protected or not i have to look that up but generally i can tell you putting mothballs down their hole is uh illegal Yes, using mothballs outdoors in the environment for anything other than controlling moths in your clothes is illegal. And if you do it and somebody or something gets injured, you are completely liable for it. Mm -hmm. So think neighbor's kids getting into it, neighbor's pet, neighbor getting into it, you are liable for it. So only use mothballs in bagged clothes to get rid of clothes moths in a closet in your house. Do people even still get clothes moths? I have been heard about it for years. I think all of our clothes, you know, are have so much synthetic material in it that it's not an issue anymore. I don't think it's been an issue since you and I were children, <laughs> really. Yeah, I think maybe then, it was more pure wool, which no, nobody wears yeah. wool in, in Florida. Maybe, right. maybe body up in a panhandle, but nobody else has wool clothes here. Or maybe 100% cotton. I'm not sure. But yeah, Corey yeah. points out there's a lot of things that could be putting little holes in your yard. Moles, gophers, deep digger beetles. It's just about that time of year for them. That's a great big scarab. Well, it's not that big. It's a big scarab beetle that digs holes in your lawn and will leave a little mound of sand with a little hole about as big around as a highlighter, I guess. That's how big the hole is in the ground. Let me get, there. there we go. And the beetle digs a couple feet deep and digs a little um, series of chambers and lays its eggs. Doesn't hurt anything, won't hurt your lawn, doesn't hurt anything at all. But that's something that confuses people. It's like, oh my gosh, what's that little pile of sand? There's a hole. And they think, I have a gopher. It's like, no, you just have a deep digger beetle. Don't have to worry about it. 
um, somebody, I think, up there mentioned um, a hunting dog. It really, any dog, um, if it's going through your dog's area, I've seen even my teeny tiny dogs. Um, of course, you know, one is part poodle, so it's probably bred for, you know, finding things in the shrubs and stuff. They'll fall. You you watch your dog looks crazy, but they're they're following it underground and they're trying to pounce on it. Um, basically, the thing the only thing we know of is just keep annoying. You can annoy it with a shovel, mess with their holes, and uh, like Bill said, annoy it into the neighbor's yard or somewhere else that wants to go. So. Sure, we're we're big proponents of non-toxic control so if you have caterpillars throw them over the fence into your neighbor's yeah, yard um wendy never move next door never move next door to dr lester here he does awful things to his neighbors anything he doesn't want he just throws over the fence into their yard <laughs> sure if you have a mole just aggravate it till it moves into your neighbor's yard problem solved nothing wrong with that and, and corey mentioned yes um and that is the law that using anything that is not labeled as a pesticide as a pesticide is technically illegal. Yes, it is. And you are responsible for any bad things that might happen because you did that. Right. Now, you're not going to be, most likely, you're not going to be thrown in jail, but you could be held liable. So. Yes. It's called civil lawsuit, potentially. <laughs> and it's not good for the environment, so... You don't want to throw big balls of ammonia into the ground or or especially you know i've even known people to do worse than that um oh you know. i've read and heard of some pretty amazing things that i'm not even going to share on here i wouldn't want to no put that i don't want to even put that idea head. but they drench um corn cobs with just terrible stuff you know and it's just it wasn't a good thing yeah so. so, Wendy, Heather has another question here, and she grows some of the stranger edibles. There's a lot of um, Asian and tropical vegetables that we can grow here. Things like katuk, moringa, longevity spinach, which isn't a true spinach. It's a plant that you can eat kind of like spinach. Sisu spinach, which is a new one on me, and Okinawa spinach. I'm kind of familiar with it. Any suggestions on how one could eat them? I posted in the private chat a recipe. I am not familiar with those um, particulars, um, edibles, so I would need to do some research on that one. Um, the one link I, that I put in there is from Edible Northeast Florida, and it's based on the ingredients. At least it was on the healthier side of things. Um, but look pretty tasty. Another option is to maybe look in, not to promote a particular product or, or brand, but the Blue Zones recipes, they typically have some of our, um, um, I, get, I don't want to say stranger, but, but more uncommon edibles that they may have some recipes on that website also. I'm waiting for Moringa to be the next invasive exotic. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> yeah, Moringa, a lot of people love it, and you can eat the leaves and other parts of the plant. University of Florida did evaluate it, and throughout most of Florida, it could be invasive. Because it grows really well and spreads that... really well. That's the hallmarks of something that's invasive. Right, and anything that suddenly comes on the scene and everyone decides is the end all answer to everything. Remember it was what this ice, Icea berries or whatever for a while. Now oh, yeah. it's Moringa. I don't even know if you can grow them here. No, but now they're growing the Moringa here and it just, you know, as a horticulturalist makes me concerned about their invasive potential. There's another plant I'm wondering if it's going to become invasive um, one day. <laughs> The one that's becoming very, very, very popular and is the answer <laughs> to everything um, in its various forms of availability. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, one day we're just going to have pot growing <laughs> in the wild areas and everywhere. Well, well, University of Florida has a department that evaluates them and gives unbiased information on its potential for becoming invasive. And sometimes... Let's say you have a plant 
that has potential of being very invasive, but only a few people in your county have it growing, maybe as an ornamental or something, it's probably not going to be a really huge problem, not on everybody's radar right now. But sometimes things that are brought here as an ornamental is when more and more and more people grow them, bit by bit over time, it becomes invasive. So it always had the potential, but it also takes time for it to spread. And then when it gets to the point where waterways are clogged, power lines are being fouled, uh, and the state's saying we have to spend millions of dollars to control it, then everybody becomes aware of it. Whereas when it was just a little problem, eh, you know, nobody right. knew about it, nobody cared. So, so time figures into it too. But one little piece of advice for Heather and anybody else trying to grow unusual edibles, you may want to definitely try it, but experiment with a little bit to make sure that you like it. You don't want to plant your whole yard with, I think it was Okinawa spinach. I'm not positive. We did have it growing and for sale a couple of years ago at our nursery. And raw, apparently, it was pretty good. If you try cooking it or steaming it, it would get a really, really slimy consistency. And a lot of people didn't like that. So grow a little bit, try it. And if you like it, next year, grow a whole bunch. But if you don't like it, you know, maybe, maybe pass on in the future. So what do we have here? Hunting dogs for moles and gophers. There are breeds of terriers that are very, very good at that. They'll run around and when, and they'll listen for the ant for the mole they, or gopher underground. And they gosh, look like they're insane, up. but yeah, they're following yep. it underground. Yeah. Um, see, as soon as, as soon as we brought up Moringa, that's it's going to upset people. I mean, <laughs> it hasn't proven to be invasive. We're just, I'm just, um, nor has cannabis. Um, I'm just, uh, what's the word that I want? I'm always, you know, hesitant, especially when it comes to an exotic plant. I'm always wanting to, to um, keep an eye on it to see what it's going to do. That is my, yeah. And I know there's groups out there that does it. I'm not, I mean, I, yeah. that, was, that was my anecdotal opinion. That was not scientific <laughs> whatsoever. Just, you know, after um, watching other plants and knowing the history of them. I was just saying, I wouldn't be surprised if we're not saying we're, it will happen. We're just trying to raise awareness of it. There you go. Yes, I am. I can't I lost the word. What's the what's the opposite of optimist? I'm being pessimistic uh, about it. Um, that wasn't any scientific uh, surety. But you said UF. It mentions that moringa could have invasive potential. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, because it grows really well. It reproduces. It makes pods. It's in the bean family, so it makes bean pods mm -hmm. um that when they like fall to the ground if they break open it can it has the possibility of spreading and anything the further south you are has more possibility than if it gets frozen out you know mm -hmm. you don't have freezes um these things can happen so just keep an yeah. eye on it. that's all we're saying um don't be surprised if this <laughs> you know if you hear one day oh guess what this is the next you know, you know that the, the state is not allowing anyone to sell it anymore or anything. That could be 20 years down the road, but. Yeah. So. So Andre in Citrus County has a question. Banana plant, should it go into a pot or into the ground? It's Cavendish. I would put it, it in a pot because you're in Citrus County. <laughs> I would say the exact same thing. Citrus County, you will get freezing weather every winter. We may not have gotten it yet this winter. Yeah, but close, close to 32. You will get well below 32 at some point during the winter. And if you have something like a banana growing in a pot, that you can drag into, let's say, a garage or even a screen porch or a lanai around your pool to help keep it warmer, that will give it the edge 
to keep it growing. Because if you take bananas and just plant them in the center of your front yard out in the wide open of Citrus County, they're, they'll probably survive every winter, but they will get frozen back very, very badly. And it's going to take them all summer to grow back. Then they get frozen back again. And now you're never getting bananas from them. So That's all I ever see happen is people who have bananas around here, unless they live on the water or something, um, have that kind of microclimate, which Corey is alluding to, or even along a lake or something. Um, that's what happens. They get a four foot tall banana tree, it freezes back. Next year they get a four foot tall banana tree, it freezes back. I never see bananas. So um, avocados even, have the same problem here. So if your avocado gets seriously damaged every year, it takes the whole next spring, summer and fall to recover just in time to get frozen back again. So it's never gets to the point where it's flowering, getting fruits, you're able to pick them, have them mature. Now, at one point, my, one of my sisters lived on a lake in Spring Hill and she did get bananas. So yeah, it has to do with microclimates and um, you know, the banana tree was protected from other tree cover and the uh, radiant heat, you know, temperature from the lake. I, ha I just walked by a neighbor. I've been noticing he has, I'm watching his yard. He's obviously trying to eventually plant a food forest because right now he has bananas all along the back and then pineapples all down the side. <laughs> and I see where he has raised beds of other vegetables and things like that. So I'm like, oh, I wonder if he'll ever get bananas out of those. Yeah, yeah. I'm just scrolling through random <laughs> uh, <laughs> comments here today. We have a really active group today, so. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it's that cool up there because then it won't get too hot here. I'm glad to hear that <laughs> today. Yeah, and with a lot of these different invasive plants, Moringa included, generally the further south you are, the better they're going to grow and the more invasive they can be. Pretty much all plants have a northern edge. We know because I work a lot with air potato vines and the biological controls for them, they have a northern limit. So if you, you could grow air potato vine in Minnesota, plant it in the ground. It'll grow during the summer. It'll cover a fence, nice big, beautiful leaves. Mm -hmm. When winter comes, it will totally die. You will have to get more for the next year or dig up the tubers and bulbils and replant it. It will never spread far and wide in Minnesota because it's way but too And won't they bulbils and tubers freeze in the ground? Because you can freeze them in your freezer, can't you, to make them? Yes, uh, yeah, far enough north zero. they will freeze and die. Well, Minnesota, yeah, that's a heck of a, I mean, they can't even dig graves in the winter. So I imagine, well, that, you know. The furthest north it has spread like out in the natural environment is Georgia. I don't even no. think it's as far north as Kentucky and Tennessee. Interesting. Well, they've got kudzu, so they're fine. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they got their own invasives. Uh... Okay, yeah, Lee says she's had a moringa tree for 10 years. She picks the green pods, adds them to her soup. If you pick the pods and reproductive parts diligently and don't miss any, that helps it. That definitely helps it from spreading. It sounds and, like something we need to do research on and come back with next week. Yeah. Yes. And we're not saying you have to give up your moringa tree. We're just we're sharing and raising awareness. Yes anything new that's a new superstar i would just say be suspicious healthy suspicion <laughs> that's all i would say doesn't mean don't try it but you know maybe don't buy acres and acres and acres of it <laughs> and you know test it out first yeah corey says that people further north of us have avocados and bananas outside Picking a uh, protected spot that's going to stay warmer helps. Covering it obviously helps. Some people have pretty extravagant coverings where they, 
use PVC, they build a TP, they cover it, they put um, a light bulb in a little, you know, covered light bulb down the bottom to generate a little bit of warmth. You can get pretty extravagant with that. And all those help. Mm -hmm. Probably easier to do that than to try and grow um, apples or something meant for northern climates in the south. Because you can't control the humidity <laughs> and the root rots that those plants get. Yeah, and fungal diseases. And Wendy is still on here with us. I just posted some nutritional components of Okinawa spinach. I so, is, it, is, it, um, is it from Japan or what is what is it? What the study? The, um, the spinach itself. Oh, I, I haven't read up on that. Um, I was just pulling the research and it was from 2020 that talked about the nutritional components of it. Um, I'm still looking on the others. USDA database did not have them listed. Yes, it is a um, unusual vegetable. <laughs> grown, just, I mean, you can could, you could order the seeds online and try growing it. And there's a lot of um, unusual vegetables. I've no, to the best of my knowledge, nobody grows it commercially in Florida. And it may be one of those that a couple years from now, they'll start growing commercially. Um, uh, calabasa squash was never grown commercially here in Florida, but it is now. Dr. Maru down in South Florida is working on identifying different varieties and strains and wants to get nice gargantuan squash. I had a lady send me a picture who uh, I had Dr. Maru teach a class on Zoom with me on calabasa, the Cuban pumpkin, hard squash. And a lady sent a picture to in a few days later she said, I grow calabasa. Look at the one I grew. It was 40 pounds. The lady, lady standing there, and let me let me get in the camera. She's like holding it in front of her, and the thing was huge. And I shared the picture with Dr. Maru, and he said, Can I get some of the seeds from it? That looks like a really good strain. And she sent seeds, and see, it all worked out for the best. Hopefully, maybe it'll be a new variety someday of calabasa. But Andre said, that, Andre said that um, banana is in a pot in a greenhouse for the rest of winter. That's a really good spot for it. Yeah. So, I mean, if you wanted to put it in the ground somewhere, I'd definitely wait until at least March to do so. But winter's going to come again. <laughs> so if you, you know, yes. really big pots on wheels, that might be the best solution. And Corey has 70 jackfruit seedlings. Nice. Jackfruit is, is it that fruit that you can make kind of like pork, porky kind of? It's like shredded pork. Yeah. She, yeah That's what they say. I, I haven't tried it yet. I think the, fruit, one that I have tried, the fruit gets huge. Yeah. Didn't Hannah do a really cool YouTube video on opening? opening one i believe she did oh, no. i'll have to see if we can find it on youtube and share it with your audience um it's pretty cool yeah corey lives in pasco county he said only two of them live through the cold mm -hmm. that is a very very tropical fruit tree mm -hmm. very tropical keep in mind some tropical fruit trees it doesn't have to get to 32 degrees no. For them to be very unhappy and suffer yeah, damage. 40 is, is enough, yeah. Some things below 50, they're very unhappy. They'll quit growing. They won't mm. look good. They act just like my daughter does when it gets, you know, below 60. Oh, <laughs> she like becomes me. very unhappy. <laughs> yeah, and Bill. Bill has that look right there. When Don't <laughs> like the cold. Anything, anything below 60 just ain't right. <laughs> and Corey points out the Publix sells jackfruit. Yes, I've heard that. If you keep checking with Publix, you might be able to find them. And I've seen dragon fruit at Publix. Yeah, I'm pretty sure where I had the jackfruit must have been at my son's because they're the adventurous um, vegan uh, people. 
and you know she had barbecue sauce on it and made it like pork it was pretty good wow they sell pre-packs already i mean packs that are already made up and mm -hmm. usually found in your produce section boy look at all these people experimenting with jackfruit i guess i'll look into having a class on that so i mean <laughs> Who else, who else gives Zoom classes in extension on jackfruit? And who else goes and, and you know, it's been great because all the different um, instructors, and I've had uh, Dr. Whitaker, who's the University of Florida strawberry breeder, teach a class on homeowner strawberries in the backyard, and Dr. Maru at Calabasa. If you ask them, they're all more than happy to do a class for homeowners. What about the flatwood plums that you're giving away for Arbor Day? Um, I assume those are edible, but generally they're just sacrificed to the wildlife. Is that how it goes? Yes, flatwood plums are a beautiful understory tree. In the spring, they get little white flowers on them before they get leaves. So it's like bare branches covered with white flowers. And they will give you plums. And I think Heather says it best here. That they are so sour. You could make jams and preserves out of them because uh here wendy you need to cover your ears for a moment but if you add enough sugar to something it'll fix pretty much any problem so yes i was just thinking it's kind of like beauty berries and and sour oranges you know yeah yeah beauty <laughs> berries have no taste sour <laughs> oranges are real sour um flatwood plums are really sour also but you can make preserves. Usually the recipes call for a lot of sugar, a scary lot of sugar. I made strawberry <laughs> jam once before, and I'm following the directions. And it's like, Six oh, my cups. God, you want me to put how much sugar in here? Oh, I'll be going into sugar shock or something. It turned out great, but, yeah, it's a lot of sugar. <clears throat> but a lot, a lot of people will grow and just leave the plums for wildlife because a wide variety of our little Woodlands friends really, really appreciate the, few, the food. So there, it's a close relative to a Chickasaw plum, isn't that correct? Uh, Flatwoods plum, Chickasaw plum, and hog plum are all basically the same species of tree, species. just different common names. Okay. And there's a little bit of debate about whether it, out of all of them, it breaks up into two species that are really, really super close or just one. And Heather said she's made beauty berry jelly. It's basically a purple color sugar jelly. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the birds even wait. If you see now your beauty berries are losing their leaves and you're left with the purple berries. As time goes on, those berries are going to turn black. That's when the birds are going to go after them because they turn their cells into raisins and have a higher sugar count. <laughs> Otherwise, the birds, I tell people, they treat them like a, like a kid treats vegetables on the plate. They'll eat those last. <laughs> yeah. But that way, the plants look very, very attractive all the way through winter. Yes. The nice do. thing about beauty berry is it actually adds some color and interest to your garden during the winter when mm -hmm. there may not be a whole lot else going on. I love beauty berries. Yeah. I have never taken the effort to try and make jelly out of them. <laughs> the birds can have them. The last year it um, froze on some of my beauty berries. They got frozen before. And then they turned black right thereafter. And I don't know really if the birds got them or if it fell, they fell off or anything. But that morning they made beautiful pictures with the frost on the beauty berries. Okay, Wendy needs to run to another meeting and everything. And oh my goodness, look at what time it is. We are running long today, but that's fine because everybody's asking so many questions. Um, I am posting a link to a video, an extension video on jackfruit, if anybody's never encountered one before and you're kind of curious. Um, let me very all quickly. The fruits that, all these new fruits and vegetables we have discussed, I don't think any of them will pass any beauty contests. <laughs> but I think we're, we're past yeah. that. We're, we're into um, 
you know, finding new and fun things. Dragon fruit's kind of an ugly fruit, and it grows on a big fat cactus that grows like a really, really well down in Homestead, Florida. So those are the basics of uh, of that. Not not necessarily the prettiest fruit. Jackfruit, like I said, I've never tried eating it. I've I've, I've you know seen pictures. I've seen it's pictures. It's stringy. Of, it's stringy, like that's why they kind of make and it has the consistency of like pulled pork so that's why they kind of you know put barbecue sauce on it and everything and there might be other more fruit appropriate things to do with it but that's one of the that's the way i tried it i've heard the whole pork thing and i'm thinking that sounds disgusting (laughs) that one's pretty good (laughs) put enough spices fruit to look or taste or smell or anything like pork. I want my pulled pork to smell like pork. <laughs> so just saying, like the best thing that you do is just be adventurous and try all these things. The worst that's going to happen is you're going to go like, wow, that was really disgusting. I'm never doing that again. <laughs> and that's fine. Well, that was a lot but, of work and a lot of sugar. <laughs> but don't be like the kids who say, I only eat macaroni and cheese. I've never tried anything else. It's all disgusting. At least try it. So. And Paul is right. It was good because it had barbecue sauce on it. <laughs> yeah, sugar and barbecue sauce fix everything. So. There you go. So, hey, everybody, thank you so much. We will be back here again next Thursday at 10 a.m. Now, the two weeks after that, we will not be here. So December 23rd and December 30th, we will not be having a virtual plant clinic, but we'll be back right after New Year's, back on the 10 a.m. Thursday morning. Hopefully next week, we'll have a special guest appearing here with me at the office. She's coming to town to visit and work on a few projects. And her name is Dr. Emily Kraus. She's with uh, Florida Department of Agriculture, and she's in charge of raising the air potato beetles to help rid us of or control the scourge of air potato vines here in Hernando County. So she's been on once before. She's always a really great guest. So we'll try to get her back here. And she should be bringing some beetles with her too, so we can do a little uh, interactive showing the beetles, I guess, on the camera. So. And Lily, no beetle jokes. I cannot promise that. No beetle jokes. No, I cannot promise that. I'm sorry. It it might just happen. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, no screen sharing album covers or anything like that. But you love me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) You'll sneak it in somehow. But hey, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you for all the uh, activities on here. Thank you to our new regular viewers. We're always trying to kind of grow the crowd and grow the group here. And we will see you back here again next Thursday morning at 10 a.m. Until then, everybody take care and see you then. Bye-bye, everyone.